Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to another episode in the series Dawah Ilallah. As we go through the look at the comparative sciences in a way to be more effective in our Dawah. Doing a little bit of comparative studying now. And uh, we are looking specifically at the Christians' evidence that they present to us regarding whether Jesus, peace be upon him, was actually crucified or not. And we said there are many alternative theories. We don't agree with any of these theories. My job is not to give you solutions. My job is simply to give you questions. I am not a motivational speaker. I'm a demotivational speaker. I'm not to tell you how great life is. I'm here to tell you how wrong and bad life is, especially if you're a Christian. If you're a Muslim, I've got lots of good news. So my job is not to give you what happened. It's to be a prosecutor. And so these are not beliefs that I hold. I don't believe any of this stuff, to be honest. I'm not here to tell you nice, sweet stories about the crucifixion scene. I'm here to tell you why there are problems and why we cannot believe it as credible. That's it. So people may be upset with me and people may not agree with me. I'm not talking from a perspective as a Muslim. We are talking from a perspective as a student simply looking at the text and saying, how can you get this interpretation from the text? We are asking you to question where you get these beliefs from. We as Muslims totally have a different understanding of what happened to the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him. That is very important to understand. If we look at the entire scene that is spoken about at the actual crucifixion, we're not where that happened before, we're not interested in what happened later, how many days, all that, we're not interested. We are talking about the crucifixion itself. If we look at the crucifixion story, it looks as if, if you are looking at it from a Christian perspective and you believe that Jesus is a God, or is part of the Godhead, that he is a very incomplete God. How do we say this? Well, the idea of a God being killed and being dead for three days is not a very complete God because a God is now separated from the Godhead. He is separated from himself. If you take your arm and you cut your arm off and you leave it on the side of the road without being put on ice or any medical treatment for three days, no matter what you do, it ain't going to come back to life again. It's going to remain very much separate from the body. So the idea that the Son of God or Jesus the Divine, whatever you might look at it from a Christian perspective, his dual nature of being both 100% man and 100% God according to Christianity, there is a big problem with the three days. If God is supposedly incarnated into Jesus and he is 100% man, 100% God, the 100% God is dead for three days. Therefore, the universe is without a creator for three days. It would be like saying to the earth, we do not have gravity for three days. What do you think the situation will look like after three days? There'll be nothing left. The whole of life as we know it would have come to an end. Just three days. So the idea of a God being away for three days, even if he has a backup plan with two others, it still means that there is an incomplete Godhead. And the idea of a God being misplaced for three days is very dangerous. A very dangerous theology to have. But some Christian theologians, in trying to resolve the cubic cube, have mixed up the colors and made it even more difficult by saying, no, but he wasn't just nowhere, because he wasn't in heaven, we know this. Because when he raises from the dead three days later, he says, do not touch me, for I have not been to the Father yet. So we know he's not in heaven. We know where he's nowhere else. There's only one place he could be. And this is where Christian theologians say, no, he went to hell for three days. If he goes to hell for three days, then he's no longer God because hell is where God is not. And therefore, he becomes no longer God. The other issue is if he's down in hell, not that hell is down, but if we're looking at it from a loose understanding, then why does he have to go through the suffering of the crucifixion if he's really going to suffer in hell? Why does he have to go through suffering on earth and suffering in hell? Surely there would only be enough for him to suffer in one place. If he goes to hell, that would all that would be required. He doesn't need to have to go through the crucifixion, the mocking, the floggings, and all the rest of it. 
surely he'd just go to hell. There's no need for both. What's the purpose? There's no ancient ruling for this to have happened. We don't see the likeness of it in the Old Testament. Because Christians like to superimpose the Old Testament sacrifice of the lamb onto Jesus being the sacrifice. But we don't find the lamb, you know, suffering in a burning fire and a furnace for three days. And then after that, the lamb coming out without any markings on him and being fine. So the only similarity to it is something dying. But there's no idea of this three days in hell. And even if we put the sinless person, according to Christianity, into hell for three days, it creates so many other theological issues. So it creates the idea of an incomplete Godhead or an incomplete God not being whole. And this is just not acceptable to any reasonable human being. Even an unreasonable person cannot accept this. Even the atheist will go, uh. So it's not possible for the concept to have been. And so if you add the idea that he went to hell for three days, the argument becomes even more confusing. So let's have a look at the next point that we come across when looking at the idea of the crucifixion. And that is the idea of the Passover. Passover is a festival that is celebrated. For the Jews, the Passover is a very important festival. It has very deep religious significance. And a large number of pilgrims from all over the world would be coming to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover at the time when Jesus, peace be upon him, was supposedly crucified, when the crucifixion took place. And they came for this specific celebration almost in the same way as Muslims would go on Hajj. Very, very pious period of time. They are not interested in anything else other than what they came there to do. It's a time where you're trying to get rid of the sins of the previous year or the sins of your past. Most people, it's a once in a lifetime experience. So Jerusalem at that time would be filled with pilgrims. And some of these pilgrims would be indifferent or perhaps opposed to or even hostile to Jesus, peace be upon him, at that time. But a large number of those people who came would have come from Galilee, where Jesus came from, where he did all his miracles, where he turned, did all the miraculous things that he did. And they would have been defenders of him. And they would have not been silent. There wouldn't have been a 10 or 20 of them like we see in the movie. There would have been a few thousand of them. A great number that would have come. And they would have heard of the miracles that Jesus had performed. They would have had friends or friends or cousins or somebody who would have known something. And so once Jesus had been arrested and he had been securely tied up in the system, they would have made sure that they would have done everything to break him out. They would have caused riots in the street. They would have been protesting. You think what was happening in Egypt and places like that would have been something to make news of? This would have made more news. And even those people who came there for the celebration for the Passover would not have been interested in getting their hands dirty because they would have broken the whole spirit of the Passover. So it's very, very unlikely that during this Passover that the crucifixion scene would have taken place at this time, and especially not for somebody who was so well known. It is likely that the whole idea of the crucifixion taking place at the Passover time was superimposed later by Christian theologians to make it look like, oh, like the Passover sacrifice of a lamb, same Jesus was a lamb that was sacrificed. So the story was moved from whenever it actually did happen, or if it ever did happen, to this period of time. It would have not happened at this time. There would have been riots, there would have been protests, people would have been angry. No matter what had happened, there would have been defenders, there would have been haters, there would have just been chaos in the streets. There would have been those people that were part of the opposition and those people that were part of the condemnation. So when we look at this, it is very unlikely that this took place. And it is not understandable as to what the rush was anyway to pass the sentence of death on Jesus during this time. If you know it's a heavy, very conservative religious time of the year, why not just wait for the two days to go over? After it's done, then you can do the public execution. Why do it at the time where you know it's going to cause animosity and violence and terror and hate and anxiety in the streets? And remember that the Romans 
were not interested in what Jewish custom was. They were pagans. And the Jews would not have wanted to break the spirit of the Passover. They would not want to have got their hands dirty in anything. And if we look at the account, it was Thursday evening. Friday is when the Passover began. Do you really think that the high priests and the bishops, important religious leaders, would want anything to do with a long trial, especially at 12 o'clock at night? So the whole story is extremely doubtful that it was on that period of time that anybody would want to have broken the spirit of that Passover period. Even modern Jewish scholars would say, not possible. They would never have done that at that time, no matter how serious the crime, as we'll get to what the punishment actually is for blasphemy and why the crucifixion, why crucify someone for blasphemy? Never been done in the past, never was going to be done in the future. So when we look at this whole story, we find that it is of a very doubtful nature. In fact, more than doubtful, extremely unlikely. And if it didn't happen during this time period, it's time for us to take a break. When we get back from the break, we'll continue in Shalom. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. We're talking about the Passover in relation to the crucifixion taking place during this time. The Jews were very, very busy indulging in their own preparations for this extremely important time of the year for them, when they were going to come from all over the world, or the then known world, to come and celebrate a very important festival. And so they would not have been interested in indulging in a midnight trial especially the great religious leaders of the day, whether they be Jews or not. Let alone the Romans waking up in the middle of the night at midnight to conduct a midnight trial. They would have simply said, keep the guy in jail. We will deal with him after the Passover. The Romans were too busy playing security guards for this whole affair anyway. And the religious leaders would not want to get their hands dirty. So spending the whole afternoon at the Roman governor's house, going backwards and forwards between the Romans and the Jews, and then back to the Romans again, how they take Jesus backwards and forwards is extremely unlikely to have taken place. And the whole idea of somebody being told to post gods in front of the tomb where Jesus was laid, again, is something that they wouldn't have wanted to be involved with, the Jewish security. Because they had already, they were convinced he was dead, according to the text of the Bible. So this whole idea that pious Jews would be involved in this blood sport at such an important time when they wanted to keep their hands clean is very doubtful. In fact, we know that it was a period of time that they didn't want to get their hands dirty because when the trial took place, the Jews wouldn't enter into the courtyard because the text says they were afraid of defiling themselves. So if you're outside the courtyard and not wanting to get involved in the trial of Jesus and afraid of defiling yourself, don't you think you'd still be defiling yourself if you're outside the courtyard and you're still screaming and shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him? It's no difference where the location is. The difference is that you're still defiling yourself. It wasn't defiling yourself going into the courtyard. The courtyard did nothing to defile the Jews, to make them break the Passover. What defiled the Jews and broke the Passover was being involved in somebody's death. So the story doesn't make any sense. It's bad narrative, it's bad literature, it's bad thought in the way the process of the story is put together. It's not a way that a god would write a book or would write a text. It wouldn't have so many mistakes and problems and problematic areas in it. Now, we must also remember that the sanctity of this Passover was that it was a Sabbath period. The whole thing was as good as a Sabbath. And we know the Jews, how strict they were with keeping the Sabbath. They would look at this Passover preparation time just as much as they'd look at a Sabbath. And so they would not want to have been seen breaking the Sabbath, and they would not have wanted to be seen having anything to do with going and checking on tombs and taking bodies and making sure all this happened. So the whole idea of this happening during the Passover would not have happened. There's no one that I can find amongst the Jewish community that would have said, yes, it's likely that this would have taken place. They've got nothing to lose by saying it because they don't believe he was the Messiah anyway. So they would say, yes, this happened, but they didn't. So we know that this didn't take place during the Passover. Did the crucifixion take place? Probably, but not at this time. Probably at a much later time or an earlier time. 
and they were superimposed over each other simply to give it some type of deep significance. In a similar circumstance, in years to come, we find that the Jews and the Romans didn't want to get involved with these type of trials. We see something happening a few years later, where it is also during the Passover festival, and they arrest a man by the name of Peter, Peter on whom the, the church is supposed to have been built, Christian church. They have the intention in Acts chapter 12 that they want to kill him. Acts chapter 12, they bring charges against him, they want to kill him. And Herod was the king of the realm at that time. He was the king. And so he could have simply ordered that Peter have his head cut off, beheaded him, like he did with John the Baptist just a few years before. He had killed John the Baptist, cut his head off and walked around with it. He had done the same thing, but not in the Passover period. He could have just simply said, behead him, and he could have had him killed, or crucify him, or stone him, or whatever it is. But why doesn't he do this? Just prior to this, he had also killed James, another disciple. So he could have killed Peter without a problem. He had already killed two people, or perhaps three, if, if you conclude Jesus in the story. So why did he not do this to Peter? Why does he need to just kill Peter at the same time that Jesus, peace be upon him, was supposedly killed in the Christian narrative during the Passover. Well, it's obviously because the Passover was so important that they didn't want to defile that period of time. Otherwise, he'd have just done it. I mean, he had done it. He had killed three people already without any problems. Supposedly one on a Passover before Jesus and then two others outside of a Passover. So he could have just done it. I mean, he wasn't like he was afraid of blood on his hands. He was quite happy with killing people. So he was more interested in other affairs to worry about something earthly like that during a Passover. An execution would have defiled the whole spirit of the festival of the Passover. That's why he didn't do it to Peter. And so Peter is spared during this period, during a Passover, not because not wanting to defile it. Why did they not spare Jesus during this period if they didn't want to defile it? And Peter had done much worse than what Jesus said, because now he's going around making disciples and claiming he has got the new church and that Jesus is now the Son of God and he's raised up into heaven. Much more blasphemy than Jesus simply saying that he is, and his kingdom is not of earth, but his kingdom was of heaven. That was the charge against him. Peter is saying much worse. Peter is now saying he is an apostle of God who is, Jesus is now raised from the dead and sitting at the right hand of God. Far more blasphemous, far more deserving of immediate death than what Jesus was. Now they'd be pleased with him. So we find that Peter's story, intriguing that he does not get crucified, time for his execution is changed until after Passover. So it doesn't make sense from the text where we see it happening to the one, but we don't see it happening to the other. So what we find is that it is very odd when we look at the text. The more we look at the text, the more we find these inconsistencies with the narrative talking about the crucifixion. Now, the Friday before the Passover, when this happened, is the day of preparation for that coming festival. So Thursday night, they arrest Jesus. Peace be upon him. Friday is when the trial takes place. But it's a day of preparation for the Passover, a deeply religious period of time. The Jews were going to be too busy in preparing for buying product, buying everything before the sun goes down, to worry about long trials and all standing out in the courtyard saying, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I mean, think about the Hajj. You don't waste a minute. The longer you wait, the longer it's going to take for you to finish whatever you're going to be doing. You're not going to go around shopping on the days of Hajj. You go and you get it done because it's going to take you a long time to do. So you're not going to be wandering around, having long discussion and getting involved in political affairs. Whatever happens at this time, we see that if Jesus, peace be upon him, was actually found being blasphemous, claiming to be the Son of God. What was the sentence that would have been carried out? It's Friday. The Jews were thinking, okay, this man has come here. We've arrested him on Saturday. Let's get this trial sorted out quick and just deal with it fast. What would the sentence be for somebody who claimed to be God or the Son of God? What would the Jews have done? Anybody know? That sentence was stoning to death. That's the sentence that has always been like it. If you claim to be the Son of God or whatever, the sentence was simply stoning to death. So why not simply just stone Jesus to death and get it over with? It would have been 10 minutes. It would have all been over. 
No big crucifixion scene, no worry about big riots taking place in the streets or the city. You could have just simply stoned him, take the body out, and that would have been done. So why crucifixion? It doesn't make any sense at all. What's the purpose of changing what is tradition for thousands of years for blasphemy, and now for the first time ever, changing it to a crucifixion? Do you have an answer? Question. Like you said, that why would they change the customs and traditions of the past? So why? Why did they change? My question is, why did they not stone him to death, which was the penalty that was required for blasphemy? Why choose the crucifixion? So we can get spiritual about it, and we can say because it fulfilled a prophecy or something like that from the Old Testament. There is no prophecy in the Old Testament that said he needed to be crucified on a cross. So the requirements of why didn't you just stone the man and get it over with? We find that these are later stories that came along that they added in and they said, no, he was crucified. Or there's another possibility that the reason for the crucifixion to take place and the Pilots and the Romans and the Jews not to pass the sentence of stoning is because they know if he was stoned, he would have been dead. So preventing him from dying they choose crucifixion. And they say, part of a conspiracy, let's not stone him, which is the normal custom, let's crucify him. Then we can instigate and change all the events that take place to make sure he doesn't die, and to perhaps put the, another person in place. But it's unlikely that they would have chosen, if they believed he was a blasphemer, that they would have crucified him, they would have stoned him. This is looking at the New Testament. We're not interested in anything else other than what the New Testament scriptures say. We don't believe in this narrative. This is from the text itself. It gives enough evidence that it's of doubtful nature because of all the contradictions and the misunderstandings of the culture and the events of the time. If a person was writing this narrative and he knew that blasphemy was a sin and that the penalty was stoning, why would he say the charge was a blasphemy? That's why he's crucified. It doesn't make any sense. So the charge was not for blasphemy, it was some other reason. So the text is wrong in what it says. So as we go through the study, we find fault after fault, problem after problem. So it's not what we as Muslims believe, you must understand this. This is what we are looking at as analyzing and looking at it from an analyst's point of view, and we're saying there are great problems. Well, that's all the time we have for today's program, so make sure you join us again, same place, same time. So for me, Arib Islam, and the rest of us here, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.